<clears throat> so thank you all for coming today and welcome to the DXC open meeting that we're calling Individuals versus Systems, Emergence, Analysis Frames, Analysis Frames and Social Change. The, the plan of the talk is I, I have kind of three very important points to make in this talk. The first is that frames matter, the way we frame an issue, the questions that we ask matter. Um, the second is that individual consumer choice, which is the traditional frame that is used in the animal rights movement, might not be the best frame for understanding the problems of animal rights. And the third is that there are certain emergent properties, properties such as culture, social and moral norms, and institutions, which is a term that I'll define a little bit later, matter far more for influencing social change than a lot of the variables that we're most concerned with in the animal rights movement. So let's just move on to the next slide. Okay. So first, what is the motivation for this talk? Well, I have a friend, actually I have quite a few friends who were at Animal Rights 2013 this year. And the big debate at AR 2013 was between Bruce Friedrich and Gary Francione, and it was about abolitionism versus welfareism. And there were two perspectives being offered. And everyone thought that this was kind of the relevant debate that we needed to talk about. Um, and the debate was this, you know, Bruce Friedrich believes in welfareism, he believes that in the slippery slope that we can kind of um, offer people human meat or incremental welfare changes like bigger cages, better deaths, and that will kind of slowly push society and individuals towards abolitionism and, and veganism. And Gary Francion says that to the extent that we're offering people these options and advocating them, it just mollifies them and convinces them and reassures them that they can exploit animals in a humane way. So there's this big debate that's raging, there are a lot of angry people on both sides, um, and I guess, I, I think it's an interesting debate. There are a lot of insights for us to learn from that debate on both sides. But I also think the debate might partly miss the point. And the question I think we need to ask is, if we compare the animal rights movement to other social justice movements, have individual consumer choices, which are at the forefront and at the, the foundation of, of both of these different perspectives in the animal rights movement, are individual in consumer choices and in, in marginal economic shifts like the closing of one business or the opening of another business, really what we should be considering and asking questions about at all. Um, and I think, you know, if we, if we think back to the civil rights movement, the anti-slavery movement, the gay liberation movement, very few of these mo movements focused on consumer actives and consumer choices. And with a lot of these movements, you might say, well, consumer choices just weren't naturally a big part of the movement because, you know, was anti-racism and the civil rights movement really a consumer issue? Um, I would argue that anti-speciesism might not be as much of a consumer issue as you think, but I could still grant that point and say, if you look at the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s, that clearly was a movement that was fighting the commodification of a class of beings, namely, you know, non-white non -white persons in America. And yet, if you look at the dialogue, um, as I'll show you in the next slide, and the messaging and the tactics that were being used by the anti-slavery movement, they weren't so much about boycotting products, they were about empowering people to take action against slavery, things like the Underground Railroad protests direct action, lobbying, all sorts of different activism, but the key was motivating people to action and not just the form of consumers. So as I said, I think anti-slavery is the best parallel to the modern animal rights movement, in part because there's a movement largely comprised of allies. Very few people who are actually living in conditions of slavery were able to effectively advocate for themselves. And again, yet, notwithstanding the fact that this was a movement that was basically fighting the commodification of the class of beings, the focus was not economic change. Indeed, there are prominent scholars, including one of my former teachers at the University of Chicago, who won a Nobel Prize, Robert Fogel at the University of Chicago, who have basically found and, and demonstrated that slavery, in fact, was a growing and burgeoning economic institution. And from a purely material perspective, from a purely economic perspective, there was no reason for slavery to change in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. It was a very profitable industry. And what changed it was a moral, a movement of moral dissent. And this is one of my favorite activists, William Lloyd Garrison, a pioneer and anti-slavery activist, and one of my favorite quotes from him was, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I am in earnest. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. And again, I think the distinction here was, Garrison was very much about motivating people to action and speech. He wanted people to act up, to speak out not just to, to change their behavioral practices. And prior to Garrison, there had been movement for literally hundreds of years to try and convince slaveholders, one by one, to many the slaves, to give up on slavery, to stop buying slaves. And that movement had been largely a failure until the anti-slavery activists in the 1830s came along and said, what we need to do is change the, the, the dynamic, the dialogue in this movement completely and create a new sense of urgency. 
So what does this have to do with the subject um, of, of, this, of this talk? Well, what I'm going to suggest is the change in emphasis that was created by William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass and many other anti-slavery activists in the 1830s was really a change in frames. Um, they, they framed the issue in a very different way. It wasn't just an economic issue. It wasn't just a matter of personal choices or consumer choices. It was a matter of the entire system's foundation, whether slavery and racism were acceptable on, on a very kind of broad, grand, inspirational, moral scale. And I think the first thing I need to do to convince you that frames matter and how we think about a problem matters is to show you some data suggesting that they matter in experiments. And um, the, the most famous experiment done over the past 20 or 30 years is an experiment performed by two scholars, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. I think they were both at Princeton. Um, it, it went like this. They basically, I, I'm going to kind of stylize and simplify the experiment, but basically they went to a number of medical professionals and ordinary people alike and asked them to approve or disapprove of a, a medical intervention. And this medical intervention um, will, would alleviate certain symptoms and would alleviate a lot of distress, but as a result, there would be 400 people um, who would survive the treatment and 200 would die after, out of every 600 people who were treated. So this is, assume this is a very kind of bad condition, something like cancer, where taking this treatment is justified, or could be justified, notwithstanding the fact that one-third of the people die. And one of the interesting things that Tversky and Kahneman found was that depending on how you frame the issue, if you said, if you went to these doctors and said, we can save 400 people with this treatment, then almost 80%, I think the figure is like 80, 90% of people, doctors, even doctors would say, yes, yes, of course, like 400 people saved, absolutely, how could we not, how could we give up on saving 400 people? But if you inverted that, that, that messaging and said 200 people will die out of 600 for this, for every time we give 600 people this treatment, suddenly there was reverse. You know, like 80 percent of people would say, no, 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 200 people being killed, we could not possibly do this. This is a terrible, terrible treatment. It would be unethical to do this. So this that simple shift in framing essentially reversed the consensus around this treatment. I'm showing you this is just a picture of, of dead bodies, and obviously part of the reason. Part of the reason this framing was extremely effective is because of the emotions it generates. When, when you think about the story you tell, the images in your brain, when you think about 400 people saved, you think of babies coming to life, you think of sick people getting up and, and interacting with their family, living good lives. Well, if you frame it as 200 people being killed, suddenly the image you get is something like this. And emotionally, this is a very negative image, and it, it motivates you to be against the, per the, the treatment that issue. So again, and this is... You know, lives saved seems like a very safe and attractive outcome. Lives killed seems risky and haphazard. How could we possibly do that? So this is the counterpart to the last thing. And if you see, if, if somebody tells you this treatment will create this image, how could anyone oppose this, right? But on the other hand, if there's a, if there's a counterpart to this image, which is the image you see in the last slide, then how could anyone support that, right? But on the other hand, this treatment has, has both of these images, in a sense. Okay. So this, is, this framing issue that Tversky and Kahneman first examined in, I think this was in the 1980s, possibly in the 1970s, was an example of a very small shift in framing. Uh, and it, it wasn't kind of a fundamental rethinking of the problem. It was just, let's look at the same question, the same problem, from two different perspectives and see what sort of result we get. And as I, as I showed you, and as you can see in the data, the results are often hugely different, depending on how you frame it, even in these small ways. But there are other sorts of reframings that are even more important, right? So um, one, way, one way to look at the problem of this treatment is, um, so in other words, we can ask ourselves, what, what happens if not only do we change the framing in a, in a very kind of slight way and manipulate it in a small way, what happens when we ask a completely different sort of question? So let's, let's think back again to this treatment example. There's, there's a 606 people, we have this treatment available. And doctors, you know, for decades might be thinking about this, this disease as, as a question of how do we treat these individual patients. But there might be a prior question, which is how do we stop the disease in the first place? So the treatment question is a question that we ask after the disease has already affected someone and they're probably already going to die. But maybe a more effective way of stopping this disease is to take a step back and look at prevention, right? Depending on the disease, like say it's a sexually transmitted disease, maybe a better way of trying to cure AIDS is figuring out what's causing it, what are the social dynamics, whether we, we can give people condoms, whether we can give people you know, other, sorts of, other sorts of social and policy interventions that stop the transmission before it happens. So reframing the question, asking a different sort of question can give us better and more promising answers. So again, this is just what I said, right? The framing of the problem, the question you ask, will fundamentally affect the variables that you care about. So if you think about a disease question and say, like, 
should we use this treatment? Then you're looking at this individual patient and asking how this treatment affects their outcome, right? But there might be a prior question, which is how do we stop the disease on a social, on macro, and community-wide scale that might be more important even from stopping and preventing individuals from getting sick, right? And the question there is on a system-wide level, what makes the entire community avoid transmission of the disease? It might be things like vaccines. It might be things like, you know, distributing condoms and other sorts of um, protective measures. And if you only are focused on the individual level variable, if you're only focused on how do I treat ind each individual patient, you're going to miss the bigger and more important question, which is how this disease spreads in the first place. So there are a lot of um, different other, other examples of, of this sort of reframing affecting solutions. Um, and I'm just going to give you a few of them. And two of, other, two of the other ones are also from the field of medicine, um, partly just because I've been thinking about it a lot, because my mother is unfortunately quite ill. But one is the germ theory of disease, which um, is, a, is a theory that has only been around for a couple hundred years. And before the germ theory of disease came along, there was a theory called the miasma theory. And the theory, the miasma theory was basically that there, there are certain pollutants in the air and the water that could get into our bloodstream and just cause a defect in our basic biological mechanisms. And so the way we thought about disease was not so much in terms of social transmission and one person infecting the other. It's just that there's something wrong with my blood. So you, you might have heard this old story about leeches that they used to use leeches to clean the blood because they thought, oh, there's just something wrong with your blood. There's something wrong with this particular individual. They've been contaminated by something. We just need to fix that. When it, it turns out, it actually was not me at all that was causing the disease. It was the people around me that was causing the disease. And, but we didn't figure this out until very recently. And after we, we conceived of the question, right, instead of saying, like, what's wrong with this, this particular person, we started looking at what's wrong with kind of the entire epidemiological chart. Right? There's a ton of people who all seem to be suffering from this disease, and the way we need to figure out how to stop it is by stopping them from interacting with each other, right? And this is why quarantine was invented, this is why we have antibiotics treatment, this is why when we have surgery, you know, surgeons are required to wear surgical gloves, it's just to prevent infection, because the understanding now is that disease is an interactive phenomenon, it doesn't come intrinsically from me or even from the environment, it comes from our interactions. And that was a fundamental breakthrough in stopping, you know, um, stopping infectious diseases. And, you know, million, literally millions and millions of lives are saved every year because of proper sanitation. Um, another example is cancer. So, for a long time, cancer was perceived as a defect in particular cells. And this is, let's, let's move the frame of analysis away from individuals to individual cells. Cancer cells are cells that divide uncontrollably and damage the rest of the body. And they don't stop dividing until the, the organism dies. And, and so for a long time, the focus of treatment was, you know, destroy those cells. Let's stop those cells from growing. But there's actually a prior question, which is how did those cells start growing and controllably in the first place? And there's been a lot of innovation over the past 10, 20 years on changing the ecosystem around these cells. And the example here of this picture is an example from a drug called Avastin. And Avastin is a drug that my mom is actually taking right now that is saving her life, that instead of focusing on destroying the cancer cells themselves, prevents what's called angiogenesis. So cancer cells want to divide and grow uncontrollably, but to do that, they need lots of blood. And so they, had, they secrete hormones into the surrounding, the surrounding cells around them to form capillaries and blood vessels that feed them and allow them to grow. And if you can stop those capillaries from forming, you can affect their ecosystem, you can stop cancer in its tracks. And that's what Avastin does. There are many other mechanisms like this. Another drug that my mom is on is actually an immunotherapy. So instead of focusing on the cancer itself, what it does is it affects the immune system around the cancer cells and allows the T cells to attack the cancer cells more effectively. The point is, lots of times focusing on the individual components is not as valuable as focusing on the ecosystem around, even if you're trying to get rid of those individual components. And then finally, I talked about this in the, the presentation on effective meme spreading, but um, the last example is the social cognitive revolution in behavioral science. So for, for decades, if not centuries, I think, especially in economics, but also in many other social scientific fields, the, the thinking was that if we're trying to change society, we have to look at individuals. Individuals are what matter. And there's a theory pr proposed and, and pushed by Stalin and B.F. Skinner that basically conceived of individuals as these black boxes. All we have to do is like look at the individual incentives, look at the individual kind of profit and loss, suffering and pain, benefits and costs, and we can determine how they're going to behave and you know, scale that up to a billion and we've got the way an entire society behaves. That has been basically fundamentally discredited over the past 30 or 40 years by the cognitive and social revolution. We now understand that human beings are highly social animals, they're animated by ideas, by ideologies, and by institutions. And there are many examples of this, of this, of this phenomenon, but one of my favorites is um, the Stanford Prison Experiment, which you know, was an experiment that was performed not so far from here that showed that if you put people, basically 
a bunch of Stanford students who are otherwise well-behaved, ethical, very normal students were put into an institution where they were asked to behave in very violent, oppressive, brutal ways. And within literally days, all of them had adopted this, the, these kind of characteristics and these behaviors because the institutions around them had been shaping them and telling them that you're a prison guard now. You're, it's your job. It's your, it's your role to be brutal to the, guard, to the prisoners. And they were. And it was so bad that they had to shut down the experiments. It's just one kind of very micro-scale example of how individuals are heavily affected by institutions. And one of the funny things about the cognitive revolution and social, social revolution in behavioral science is that it basically shows that slow down. So it basically shows that the one thing that I think almost all of us say do, does not affect us does affect us. Like if you ask anyone, like, are you influenced by your peers? Do you do what the people around you? Are you a follower? Almost every single one of us say, no, I'm not a follower. I do what I want to do. You know, like I don't care what other people say. But that's just fundamentally not true. If you look at the data, everybody's a follower. You know, if you think you're not a follower, you're wrong. <laughs> so um, all of these, all of these these examples I offered you because they're examples of different frames of kind of looking at the question from a different perspective and getting to better answers because of that reframe. And, and so the next question we have for the animal rights movement is, well, how do we know we have the right frame? How do we know that consumer choice isn't the right frame? The short answer to this question is, I think we don't know. There's always quite a bit of uncertainty in, in kind of how we should act as activists. But the better answer is that when we're dealing with especially a very complex system with lots and lots of interacting parts that nonetheless have these macro scale patterns to them, then we have to consider whether the frame that we're looking at should not be individual components, but what social scientists and other sorts of scientists, including you know, physical scientists, call emergent properties. Um, and the two pictures here are examples of, of two different emergent properties. And the one on the left is, is an example of the wave. So uh, the wave is something that's been studied by psychologists. And, um, if you try to understand the wave by kind of looking at what each individual is thinking the moment before they have a wave, like one person might be doing it because you know there's a hot girl down the down, down the aisle that he wants to cross, another person might be doing it because his friend is doing it, another person might be doing it because they're just really enthusiastic and like moving their arms around. But that's not an insightful or, or, or important way of understanding why the wave happens. Look at why the wave happens. You have to look at the social collectivity. You look at the patterns of the mass of people moving up and down, and then you can predict, like, oh, okay, I can see the reason the wave is going this way is because all these other people are, are moving this direction, and there's, there's a coherent pattern to it. And looking at individual components is not very useful in understanding the wave. Um, and the, the other example is, is, in the physical scientists, emergence is a very important concept, and the easiest way to distinguish and to, to demonstrate this is the distinction between physics and chemistry and biology is really a distinction of different emergent properties. So, Physicists understand things at the very basic scale, right? They look at particles, they look at interactions between those particles, they look at the very basic forces of the universe. Chemists look at compounds and molecules and, and the way those compounds interact and, 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 um, and form and break their bonds. And biologists look at organisms. I mean, these are all different scales of analysis. And if you ask you know, a biologist to try and understand the behavior of a bird by looking at particle physics, he's just going to say that's just not an important way to understand this problem. Because when you go to a certain level of complexity, when you look at the complexity of a living organism, for example, you can no longer understand it as just a problem of physics because they're emergent properties. They're properties of biological organisms, things like you know, uh, blood flow, respiration, consciousness, that don't matter on the scale of particles. And I would submit that the same is true of activism and social science. So one of the most prominent examples of emergence and the importance of emergence in science um, has been promulgated by a very famous Harvard professor named E.O. Wilson who wrote a book called Sociobiology. And it's also been, I mean, emergence is, is kind of, is, is, is understood as, our, the, the behavior of ants, I should say, is understood as like a paradigmatic example of emergence. And E.O. Wilson is an entomologist and he's also kind of a general kind of evolutionary biologist who's written a lot of really interesting thought, stuff on evolutionary biology. Um, but the point E.L. Wilson makes is that for certain social organisms, again, you really don't need to and shouldn't understand their behavior as a question of each of their individual knowledge or motivation. So if you look at individual ants, yeah, each, if you look at each individual ant, uh, they actually don't have much intentionality or motivation. So I mean, ants as a whole have the intent to do things like, you know, uh, extract food, will take, take uh, dead bodies, dead ants, out of the out of the you know the hive into a separate area, um, and even to form bridges and build nets, very sophisticated, complicated operations. But each of the individual ants doesn't have the intention to do any of these things. And if you look at each individual ant, then their anatomy and the neuroscience 
it just seems like they're engaging in all these arbitrary behaviors, right? They, they respond to this stimulus and that stimulus and there's no rhyme, reason, or pattern to it. What you have to do to understand the way an ants are interacting is, is look at colony-wide properties. So the intentionality that matters for ants is the intention of the colony. So one example of this is a bridge that they form. Many individual ants will sacrifice themselves and certain species of ants in order to form a bridge across water. And each of the individual ants doesn't really know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, they're doing them because they've been engineered through evolution from what, thousands if not tens and hundreds and millions of years to think this way. And they can gauge their behavior because of concrete stimuli. But they, so, you know, like if you looked at that individual ant, you might say like, oh, this individual ant just saw another ant going in this direction and went that way too. And but what you'd be missing then is the understanding of why the bridge matters for the colony. Right? And the bridge does matter for the colony because if they need to get across the bridge to get to a food source, then you could understand why the colony as a whole would seek out something like a bridge. So this leads us to the next point, um, emergence in human beings. So our human social systems meet some of the, the basic criteria of, of systems that have emergent phenomena. They're very complex systems with dynamic interactive components. There are many individual human beings all interacting with each other that lead to regular patterns, patterns like fashion, patterns like culture, patterns like religion. Right? I mean, there's, there's regularity to our conduct that can't be explained by looking at each of our individual motivations. All the people who live in certain countries happen to be a part of a certain religion. It would be sort of surprising and, and really unlikely for all of them to just kind of independently have decided, oh, I just want to believe this, or I just want to believe that. You know, I believe that I want to believe that 56 versions will be available for me when I die, or I want to believe that, you know, in reincarnation, or whatever it is. I mean, all these beliefs, they cluster in important and interesting ways that we have to understand as actors. Um, and again, as I said before, the one thing that influences human behavior that none of us is really willing to admit is the people around us. So then the question is, what causes these communities to shift? What causes systemic change? And I think the, the last presentation, the last open meeting, talked a lot about this. But the two important components are ideas about human interaction, especially ideas about appropriate human behavior, and institutions, which are basically ideas that have been formalized, and people that push those ideas. So let's look at some examples. I mean, I already mentioned the example of religious movements, and that's what this picture is. So in, in certain countries, you know, you have people who are living in near poverty conditions who will spend years, sometimes decades of their life, saving up for a single pilgrimage to Mecca. Not because it actually has any direct material instrumental benefit to them, but because there's an idea they have, which is it's an important part of my identity uh, as a Muslim, or a certain type of Muslim, to make this pilgrimage to Mecca. You know? and and people spend, again, decades of their life and time and are motivated to do this, and almost everyone will do this in cultures where it's believed to be an important part of their identity. But, you know, we might say, like, oh, these are kind of, you know, the, these are historical periods that humanity has moved beyond, that we have a much more liberal, individual-focused society now than we did 30 or 40 years ago, and these things only happen in less developed countries. Well, that's not true, because if you look at more recent phenomena, like Occupy Wall Street, um, the same thing has basically happened. Well, what has what driven these movements isn't necessarily each of us independently deciding that I, I care about inequality or I care about financial graft and financial corruption. What happens is that there's an idea that starts to develop, it, it, it forms into a critical mass, and suddenly everyone in our society is talking about them and trying to push them. Um, and then the last example, and I always give this example, is even something as trivial as anti-smoking behavior. I mean, I think for most of the past 30 or 40 years, until a very famous scholar at Harvard named Nicholas Krasakis came along, the thinking behind smoking was, let's focus on the individual. Why are they smoking? Why, what can we do to make them stop smoking? Let's convince them that if we give them information, if we show them how horrible their lungs will look if they smoke, how much damage it will do to their family if they die, that they'll stop smoking. And we've wasted, in my opinion, wasted billions of, and not just my opinion, but many scholars' opinions, we've wasted billions of dollars in advertising, public service announcements, you know, on individual level change. When in fact, what seems to change people more than anything else is social pressure of people around them. So when Nicholas Krasakis has found, if there's, if there's one person within your community who stops smoking, um, it increases your likelihood of, stop smoking, of stopping smoking by 20%, which is a massive, massive shift. Like 20% is a massive probability shift. Um, and the key thing is that, and one of the interesting things from this literature is that it's, it's not even so much about whether someone stops smoking, it also matters their reasons for stopping smoking. So Krasakis has pointed out that someone who smokes but nonetheless has very strong views against smoking, so like the, the, the classic self-loathing smoker, can actually have a much bigger impact on stopping smoking 
than someone who doesn't smoke and tolerates that sort of behavior. So a smoker who constantly says like, ah, I don't know why I'm smoking, this is so terrible, I'm killing myself, I'm such an idiot, everyone who smokes is idiots, why do people do this to themselves? It's such a disgusting behavior. That sort of person can actually influence cascade in a cascading way. Smoking in their local community is far more than someone who doesn't smoke, but otherwise says supportive and positive things about smoking. But again, the key thing is, is not just what the individual is doing, it's the fabric of their social community. It's the social norms that animate their minds. It's the social pressure they face when they engage in that behavior. So if there's a lesson we can draw from a, a lot of this research, and I talked a lot more of this in the effective meme spreading presentation, it's that there are two emergent properties of human communities that might matter more than individual attributes in affecting social change for animals. And those two emergent properties are institutions and I said I was going to define institutions, and here it is. And institutions are basically ideas, formalized of others, that govern human relations. And there are two famous economists, Douglas North and Robert Fogel, who have done a lot of research on this issue and shown that institutions shape not just individual behavior, but wide-scale social change in massive ways and are far more important than anything we can do as, as individuals um, um, at affecting real and permanent change in the long term. Uh, and the second is interactions. So the institutions matter, but interactions are kind of where we get to institutions. So shifting the willingness of individuals to interact with others to establish new institutions is just as important as the institutions themselves. And in a, in a certain way, like institutions and interactions are basically two sides of the same coin. So Krasakis and Fowler have written a lot about how social pressure and social norms can affect institutions, but institutions can kind of feed back in interactions as well. If there's an institution that exists, whether it's a legal institution or a moral institution, against homophobia, then it's going to affect the way I interact with other people. Right? If everyone around me, and our, even my laws and, and my moral code, is telling me that when someone says you know, the N-word towards an African-American or the C-word towards a Chinese-American, then when I hear someone say those words, I might act. On the other hand, if we don't have those institutions, I'm probably not going to interact with them in that way. So they feed off of one another. Okay. So let's just sum up. Um, so this is a very kind of cursory examination of emergence in, in social change. And if anything, I think of this talk as more of like a source of generating hypotheses and starting discussions and proving anything. Because um, honestly, I didn't spend an enormous amount of time in kind of getting down all the citations and getting the quotes because this is sort of a, a quickly prepared PowerPoint. But um, if I'm going to sum up the, the hypothesis that's offered by this talk, it's that First, the AR movement is dominated by one frame of analysis, and that is the individual consumer choice, economic choice frame of analysis. Um, this matters in part because frames matter. The frame that you use fundamentally affects not just your judgment on an issue, which we saw with the saving versus losing lives example of doctors being proposed two different treatments, one where they lose lives and one where they save lives, and depending on how you framed it, they have very different emotional judgments about those two treatments. So it's not just that it affects your judgment, but it also affects what you perceive as important. Right? If you're looking at the individual lens, what you're going to look at is individual behavior, individual attributes. If you're looking at the systemic lens, then you start looking at systemic properties like culture, like institutions, like interaction. Um, and so the point I made was that in the context of AR, there's at least a compelling hypothesis, a compelling theory that suggests that emergent frames are much more important than individual components. That, that we are much more like ants than we'd like to, than we'd like to think. Um, we're very social animals, that's the reason we develop language, it's the reason we have mirror neurons, it's the reason we have a large frontal cortex, to interact with other people, to understand what they're thinking, and to respond in kind. Um, and if human social, social systems do have these emergent properties, as demonstrated by religion, by culture, even by government, then maybe the way we have to change these systems is not by focusing on individual components, not by focusing on individual motivations, by looking at institutions and interactions. So, concretely, what would this suggest? Well, I think there are two concluding questions we can ask, and I'm going to propose two concluding answers. The first is, are there variables at a higher frame of analysis that are more relevant to a problem than individual consumer choice? And the answer I have is yes, and that we need to change these institutions, social norms and institutions, or these variables, I should say, social norms and institutions and interactions, if we're going to change even individual consumers. So, like, I like to think of it as the difference between changing individuals and changing interactions. Almost everyone in the animal rights movement right now is focused on changing individuals and their behavior. And I think what we should really be changing is the way they interact with other people. If we want to create the sort of domino effects that we need to change our entire society. The second question is, even to the extent that we're focusing on individuals, should the movement be focusing on creating private or public actors? And again, from an emergence perspective, we have to indisputably focus on the latter. Because the variables we care about 
are not the way the individual just affects their individual selves, but the way individuals can affect these systemic properties like moral norms and, and legal institutions and moral codes. So what sort of pressure are they imparting on their local community? Um, and I think fundamentally that is a far more important question than whether we have more or fewer vegans or vegetarians or humane meat bones. So just coming back to the original question, the original motivation for this talk, instead of asking kind of Gary Francione and Bruce Friedrich's question, which is which, what is a better way to make a vegan, maybe the more important question is what's a better way to make a movement? So that's it. Um, so if anybody has any questions, maybe we can, we can talk about the ideas that have been uh, presented today a little bit. Danielle? Well, I have two things. Mm -hmm. The first was, I didn't quite understand what you were saying about the Civil War being, I mean, the slavery being um, economic versus moral, because I thought the whole point of the issue was the North was not benefiting economically, and they had the strong moral presence. The South was... So it was really moral versus economic. It wasn't really like the whole movement was moral, or I uh, guess that's what you were saying. The moral dominated. Yeah, the is moral that... dominated, and I think the North did benefit immensely from slavery, and slavery was still kind of a very important institution in the North. I mean, I think really? I mean the North. So, for example, all the cotton that was being grown in the South was being manufactured in the North, and so if cotton was being produced at very low cost, it was extremely advantageous to the North, and it gave them an advantage over countries all over the world that didn't have the advantage of slavery. And so secondly, I wanted to bring up um, with, the, yeah. with the frames. Mm -hmm. The problem with law is that like law doesn't care about morality really when it yeah. comes to animals. And so, so that's a problem. So until animals Absolutely. get standing, that's the main problem with the law. But yeah. so the law had to shift that frame to instead do it from um, like a human standpoint. So in so for example, I think nowadays the bet like the law's best attack on animal cruelty or what have you is, for example, a person, like so if, say, a factory farm, let's say they electrocute the pigs or whatever, and they're so scared they like defecate in their own like bath of water or whatever, yeah. so then the humans would then say, well, I purchased this and I... I take issue that this is affecting my health, this species sure. or whatever, so I'm going to sue based on myself. My interests, yeah. And so, so that's really, I mean, and that's, I mean, so I, I applaud the law for finding a different frame, but at the same time, that's, I, I hope that the law changes to the morality yeah. frame. But. I think that's absolutely right, and it's one of the misgivings I have about legal reforms. It's, you pointed out, an important issue, which is that animals don't have standing. They don't, their interests aren't actually represented at all in the legal system. It's always some property owner who's, who's fighting on behalf of the animal. And uh, as long as animals are conceived of this property, and I know Gary Francione has done a lot of really great work on this issue, it's, it's hard to see legal reforms as fundamentally challenging the basic assumptions we have about the status of animals. And, or even improving their welfare. You know, so. I think these perspectives that you're introducing with this presentation bear directly on that, though. Yeah. In a way, what you just mentioned, that's our institution. And that ultimately is what we fundamentally have to change. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, there's, there's, so there's a literature and in, in law and in psychology on the expressive function of law. And a lot of scholars think the, the actual kind of legal bite, the actual punishment of law, is not as important as its expressive function. That there's, not only does law, you know, pose certain punishments and costs for people who break those laws, it's also kind of an expression of a collective view on an issue, you know, like child pornography. Most, most people don't engage in child pornography not just because they're going to be punished, but because the law shows that we have this collective viewpoint, which is that this is a terrible thing, you cannot do this. And that is in many ways just as powerful as as the actual legal punishment. Mm -hmm. I think this is a conversation that needs to be engaged. This is extraordinarily important. I agree. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I just, oh, Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, I just wanted to add that that I I I I think you're right about the you know um, focusing on the institution because it's almost like people want to hear, it's okay. So for example, yeah. I don't like fur, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And if everybody around them says, it's okay, yeah. then, oh, okay, yeah. I feel better. 
Yep, and it doesn't matter what facts you present to them, as long as the people around them are telling them it's okay. And if you look at the Stanford Prison Experiment or the Milgram Authority Experiments, or even just notorious examples of massacres through history, right. you know, whether it's the Holocaust, the Mai Lai Massacre yeah. in, in Vietnam, I mean, as long as everyone else is doing it, human beings have shown the ability to do horrendous things yeah. with their own hands. Yeah. It doesn't require outsourcing it to someone else to do the violence. You'll do it with your own hands as long as the people around you are doing it. So if we don't change those common and collective understandings about whether these sorts of behaviors are okay or not, then it's, it's difficult for us to, to imagine a world where the behaviors stop. Yeah. This is, yeah. I mean, this is a bit off topic, I suppose, but what I got from the Milligram experiment and from the Stanford experiment was that people, it's not, it's not just about people around you telling you that something is okay, it's also about like um, obedience to authority. Because like like in the Milligram experiment, like they were listening to these scientists who were like, no, like this has to be done, like this is our experiment and we know what we're doing and like, you know, I, I felt like it had more to do with trust of yeah. authority than than what you're talking about. But how is authority defined? Well, I suppose somebody who's in a position of power. That and how is that defined? Well, in the experiments it was a little different. I mean, in real life it's about somebody who has coercive power over yeah. you. Well, in the experiments it's, it's, it's more about like an authority who knows more about But in the experiments they didn't have coercive power. I mean, no, they didn't. People it's, have it's more power. about an yeah. authority that knows more than you. Not just knows more than you. It's that there's a collective understanding that this is someone I need to listen to. Right. I think. right. So yeah, that, yeah. it's the same thing. There's a collective understanding that you know, to the extent that I'm participating in this experiment, I need to listen to the person who's running the experiment. Right. And that, I think but that norm, would, right, that is what animated people to continue yeah. engaging in these abusive behaviors. But it wouldn't, I'm that wouldn't have been true this. if it had just been like their fellow like volunteers or whatever saying, oh, let's do this as much, I don't feel like. It depends on how many of their fellow volunteers are saying. So there's another yeah. experiment called, that, that precedes the Milgram Authority experiment, which is also very important. And it's an experiment Sol and Ash did on conformity, which you may have heard of. And in the conformity experiment, there's a peer group of people who are all examining two lines and trying to predict which, not just predict, they can see with their own eyes which line is longer. And so they're told at the beginning of the experiment, all you have to do is like pick the longer line, just remember that. It's the only thing you have to remember. Yeah. And what, what this experiment basically showed is if everyone around you tells you yeah. that the, the longer line is actually shorter, you're going to say the same thing. It's yeah, like 80% yeah. of people will disbelieve their own eyes. And it's shocking. So some people will say like, you know, I actually think they're all wrong, but I just didn't want to stick my neck out. But there are a lot of people who just didn't believe it or not. They just thought, well, you know, if like four people said it's B, it's, it's got to be B. I mean, it's just, I mean, I must have been wrong. They just don't trust their own eyes anymore. And it's what, like, what was that one called again? It's a conformity experiment by Salman Ash. And I think, I mean, Milgram's experiment was performed, I think, in the 1970s. I mean, the, the more recent research has, has shown that pure effects dominate. I mean, yeah. obedience to authority matters, yeah. but obedience to authority is determined in part by your peer group. Like, Punk kids don't see authority in the same way as people at West Point, but authority matters in both of those communities, whether they admit it or not. You know, mm -hmm. they both matter. And the point is, authority is a social construction that a group of people collectively decide. That, you know, the experiment is an authority figure, a cop is an authority figure, or some influential member of the punk community is an authority figure. You know, and that's that's something that's a matter of collective understanding. And I who you see as authority figure is determined by your peers. Yeah, I I do agree. I do think that coerc coercive power also has to plays a role and, yeah, and it does. can like influence people to believe somebody is an authority even if their peer group even if they're not viewed as legitimate by one's peer group it can yeah. still make a difference but but no I do agree with your basic point. Yeah. No I think I think you're right. And I think I mean I think the point of the, the cognitive revolution is not so much that coercive and material power doesn't matter. It's that the channel through it which it most effectively operates is by shaping our understandings of the world, right? I mean, coercive power, there's this, there's this old line, I forget who it's by, by a very famous historian, who says that dictatorships that rely, that rely on, on brute force are called failed dictatorships. The dictatorships that actually succeed are the ones that convince people yeah. that they're actually, you know, that they should live in fear. Yeah. Like, where you no longer have to beat everyone. If you have to actually have to beat everyone, then you're not a very effective dictatorship. The dictatorships that thrive are the ones that start to convince people that, like, I have to, I have to, I have to disagree with the authority figures. You know, that's, and so, I mean, that's, it's a course of power, I would say, matters only to the extent that it reshapes, I mean, what I described as an institution, an idea about the way we should relate with each other. Yeah, I agree. James? I feel that I was thinking about the point you just raised on your summary and conclusion. Mm -hmm. 
individuals versus the system or the institution, maybe there's an important insight to be derived there. Instead of percentages or numbers of individual vegans or conversions, maybe we need to be thinking about a different metric. Yeah. How easy it is to, on a given moment, what kind of pressure is pushing us toward going into McDonald's versus searching around the city for a vegan restaurant? Yeah. Or if we want to look good, or we're buying a gift for someone who's very fashion conscious, mm. what else can we buy besides that meat mm. stole? Yeah. Yeah, I think there, there, my understanding of your question is you're contrasting between two different metrics. One is the number of vegans we're creating, and the other is the amount of social pressure and activists we're creating. And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the metrics we should be using are the number of activists we have, how big, how big our communities are, and how powerful they are, how strong they are, how empowered they are. Um, how much buzz we're getting in social media, and buzz is sort of a very non-quantitative concept that's hard to measure, but it's things like press coverage, although I, I don't think mainstream media actually matters that much, and it hasn't mattered that much for most of the movements that have developed over the past 20 years, I and mean, it's mainly been social media and local media. Like, local media meaning just kind of, you know, talking with your friends and family, and posting on Facebook, and posting on Twitter, these things matter a lot more. Like, I can read an article in the New York Times, and it's not going to influence me nearly as much as it when Chris comes to me and, and talks to me about something and about his own personal experience. That's going to, going to affect most people much more than just something that was on the news. So the news to a certain extent is important, but it's important largely because it provides a platform for individuals to have those water cooler conversations and those dinner table conversations that ultimately affect people much more. And I, but I agree with you 100% that, I mean, this is one of the reasons for the talk, that if you look at emergent properties and you start recalibrating what your dependent variable is, at one point I have in the, 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 the pre-final version of this presentation, I had a slide that was said choosing the right dependent variable. And in social science and statistics, you're, you're always focused on the dependent variable and you're looking at, you know, you're examining how different causal variables affect your dependent variable. And it's really important, and, and like, but it's easy to get caught up once you've already defined the dependent variable that you think is, that matters, in other words, the outcome, to just, think, just get locked in that frame of analysis. And what I'm suggesting is that instead of the dependent variable of like veganism, the number of consumers we create, we should be thinking about the number of activists we create. Right? It's not even individual activists. What we're trying to create is a movement. We're trying to look at, I mean, to a certain extent, we're, we're, we're almost you know, anthropomorphizing society as a whole and saying, like, how does society as a whole feel about animal abuse and how do we change that? And the way we change that, it, it's, I don't think we're that different from ants. You know? I think a lot, think to a certain extent, we are like ants. I think that's absolutely crucial. We need to stop over anthropomorphizing society. Mm -hmm. And realize we are a colony of ants. People yeah. will follow the general movement. Yeah, they will. So if you can create enough buzz and energy behind the campaign, people will jump on board. And more quickly than most people think. I Go ahead, Zion. I do I mean, I feel like I've brought this up before, but um, I guess the point I would reiterate would be like I, I do agree that, that the frame needs to be bigger for the for the movement as a whole, but I I don't I still don't agree that like creating individual vegans is like not something it shouldn't be our main focus, but I still think it's important because there's more and more vegans in this country every year, and more and more people are saying oh I have a friend who's vegan or oh my sister's vegan or something, and I feel like that influences culture. Yeah. Slowly but surely, and I feel like that starts people talking about it yeah. when we start to be more visible because there are more of us. Yeah. So I don't think that's not important. Yeah. Um, I, I but I do think, think, yeah, it, that should not be our main focus. I, I don't think we're saying it's. Actually, can Priya, I think Priya was going to say something. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't disagree. I think that you know, if there's more vegans, more power to them, but um, the question we ought to ask ourselves is how did they get there? Right, so if, if they got there because of like health choices, does it really matter? Mm -hmm. But if they got there because like they started out, for example, yesterday we met somebody at the action and she was like, I still eat animals, but you know, eventually you want to become vegan, that's irrelevant. But what's more important is that you're here participating in this action and you know, and eventually when she becomes vegan, that's great, but um, that avenue is more powerful. And, and so, and also like about creating more vegans, it's interesting because even if you even if there's like ten people in your life that you convinced or confirmed, um, as somebody said, uh, and they're they're vegans, what is going to keep them there? How 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 do we know that their social surroundings aren't going to change tomorrow or like ten years from now that they're going to stay vegan? 
and that's why we have to change social norms, and this is where, you know, yeah. no, everything I, I do agree that that's more important. James, did you have to give something? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that both are absolutely vital. The individual vegans, people that make conscious choices or go to join an activist group, they form like a foundation that can give momentum then to our institutional changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But by conversely, we can't focus only on that. We have, they both will feed on each other. Yeah. So the two things I'd say about that to follow up on all three of your comments are, one, the I think Priya is right that the, the nature of the change matters a lot. And going back to the smoking example, I mean, Someone who gives up smoking and nonetheless thinks smoking is great and really cool and fashionable and awesome and still encourages all their friends to smoke is actually kind of doing damage to the anti-smoking movement and the same is probably true of veganism. Like if you're a vegan who goes around saying, like, oh no, no, you know, it's your personal choice. It's like, ah, oh, you know, you should do whatever you want. This is my thing. Then in many ways, I think that sort of vegan is, you know, sort of a Benedict Arnold to this movement and, and undermining our cause and our momentum. And, like while they're incremental, they have incrementally changed their own behavior, their effect on the people around them is, is very, very negative potentially poisonous. And the second thing I'd say is just empirically, like I don't, I, I think veganism is, I'm kind of indifferent to it, I just think, but I just think it's a growth model that has just proven its lack of success. And I mean, there's this study that economists cite a lot, not for the proposition that veganism is effective, but for the proposition that surveys are, are sort of silly. And the, the study is that, you know, it shows that around 60% of people will self-identify as vegetarian uh, within a week have started eating animals again, or have to say that they report that they've eaten some animals within a week. So it's, it's not a very, and again, like I talk about this in much more detail in the effective meme spreading presentation, but it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a model of change that has a lot of robustness. It seems to like be very ephemeral. People are vegan one day, then their they're raw food is the next day, and then they're a paleo diet person the next day. And what we really need to change is, is the way people conceive of food, is so they conceive of it as a moral obligation to not engage in violence against animals. Like, as long as it's stuck in the consumer frame, and as long as you're thinking about this in terms of kind of consumer habits, then people will naturally feel like, oh, I can buy whatever I want, it's my choice, and I'm going to consume what I want to consume. But if you can switch that frame and, and make it an issue of ethics and violence, then suddenly it's like, oh, like, you can't just suddenly decide that you want to kill your dog tomorrow. I mean, you could, but everyone would think you're a monster. And, and what we need to do is accomplish that same sort of effect for violence against other animals if we want those sorts of changes to stick. Yeah, it really depends on somebody's reasoning yeah. for, for being vegan. And, yeah, like what their interaction is with other people, for sure. Yeah. Can you? So I have a, a, like a birth of a thought, so yeah. I haven't developed it yet. So mm -hmm. let me just give you the bare bones of it. So there's another thing that I've noticed about human behavior in that Take, for example, Joseph Smith, I think that was his name, who started Mormonism. Yeah. And so the people who got on board with Mormonism at that time, and continue to do so, I feel like there's another component to being in a system that tells you something is right, believe this. I think that there's another component, which is we're better than everyone else. Yeah. And I... I don't, I hope that doesn't happen to our movement, kind of. Yeah. It, and... Because it's exclusionary. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of people join movements for that reason, like, oh, I'm better. I'm, I wake up today and I feel better than every other group out there. Yeah. And I, I really, I just want to kind of point that out. I want to research that a little more because I, I kind of like that one, but anyway, yeah. so... So that's, you know, it's, that's sort of a double-edged sword. So there, there's two strands of literature that I think are important to this question. Uh, the first is kind of um, this literature that I think is fairly recent about kind of the powerful impact of social prestige and driving people towards social justice movements. Like, it definitely is a motivating force to become part of a social justice movement, to see yourself as kind of contributing to, to the welfare of society, doing something good for the world. And having your, your community to recognize that is a very powerful motivational force for people to do all sorts of good deeds and bad deeds for that matter. Like, if the people around you, you know, are elevating you and giving you prestige for being a jerk, you're probably going to be a jerk too. So that's that's a powerful motivating force, and I think to a certain extent we do have to take advantage of that. And that's one of the things that anytime we feel like anyone does something good as part of our community, we make an effort to try to acknowledge it because it's, it's an important part of just basic human psychology. We want to be recognized for the good things we're doing. The flip side of that, and this is the danger you're posing, is what's called the moral credential effect, which this professor at Princeton, he's not Stanford named Professor Monin, wrote about, which is that to the extent a community develops a moral identity where it elevates themselves over the people around them, it actually gives them moral license to do lots of other bad things, right? So to, if, if I can tell myself over and over again, like, oh, I'm one of the good people in the world, 
you know, I'll stop thinking about it when people criticize me because that affects my self-perception. Right? I don't even want to listen when someone says, you behaved in some sort of objectionable behavior because I am one of the good people, right? Which explains why, you know, like these religious right people who are obsessed with how morally worthy they are often engage in the most morally repressive behavior, whether it's homophobic, racist conduct. You know, they, they're constantly talking about morality and right, but they're not engaging in a lot of moral behavior. And part of that is because of moral credentials and the credential effect and, and moral licensing. And so it's like this trippy double-edged sword where we need to recognize people, but also recognize that as a community, we're not trying to elevate ourselves over the rest of the world. We're not saying that we're intrinsically better than anyone else. We're just saying that, you know, we recognize the good things we're doing, but at the end of the day, if like, you know, I always say, if, if not for small decisions that my parents made many years ago, I'd be one of the oppressors too. You know? so to a certain extent, I still am an oppressor. You know, like, the land we're living on right now is taken from them. So. What, what I like, the way I like to phrase that is, um, on this one decision, I think I've made a better decision than yeah. many other people. So as opposed to saying I'm better than someone else uh, because of this, that, or the other, I would say some of my decisions have been better than some of their decisions. Yeah. So, like, and I'll and I'll stick very strongly that some of my decisions are much better than yeah. several other people's decisions. Yeah. But uh, but that doesn't that's, that that. It's important for me to remember that that does make does not make me a better person. Yeah. And the other point that Dan will raise, which I think is very important, is the extent that you're elevating your community over communities around you. It's also it's also kind of a justification for excluding people from that community because you know we're the elite. We don't want to. I mean, this is a very natural human psychological phenomenon where if you feel like your community is is prestiged in some way, you don't want the dirty people. You don't want the less worthy people to infiltrate you. And to the extent we want a movement of growth, we need to avoid that. And part of that is just being humble and recognizing that, you know, not that I'm religious, but, but for the grace of God, I would be in the same position as many of the people I'm protesting. And in, in my case, it's, it's not that hard of a logical leap because my dad is a vivisector, so I know that oh, wow. very small changes could have led me to become one of the targets of protest. So. My dad had a leap. I'm wondering whether I'm thinking about your ant colony in a metaphor, and I'm having another proto mm -hmm. Uh Maybe we need to also consider pragmatic, non-objectified factors, like say you're going to make a road trip from here to Long Beach with a, a minivan full of kids, and they get hungry like every two hours. Any any exit you pull off of, it's it's an effort to find a vegan restaurant. Yeah. So suppose we had a world where 51% were vegan eateries uh, available for kids and it's fast and it's cheap and they have pretty pictures on their walls and it's just, it can be as much of a habit as McDonald's or Chipotle. Chipotle yeah. And what about if, say, by some magical act of Congress there were, say, a dollar penalty added to every animal killed that wound up in our food chain? Yeah. So there's a slight now rebalancing of the cost when you go to the supermarket, and if you're, you have, you got a fistful of food stamps, you're looking to save every penny you can. Yeah. Now maybe the vegetable options are looking a little more attractive. It's, 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 it's certainly a possible intervention. I think, for me, the question is, you know, is this the chicken or the egg, right? It's, it's kind of, I think to get to that point, we have to probably create a movement of people who are willing to push oh, for absolutely. it. Absolutely. There has and to be a ground swell. Exactly. So, and it, by the time we get that, you know, like, we may have already kind of, but I, I agree with you. I mean, I think, Eventually, that's our vision of the world. We want nonviolence to be the norm, to be everywhere, to be convenient even. And, um, you know, I think, I, you know, I have an interesting view on kind of vegan options and, and whether it's important for vegan options to be available and easy. Because I think there's also literature in political science and sociology and psychology about signaling and how, as an activist, it's really important that to the extent that you want to affect the people around you, you have to engage in what's called costly signaling. And to the extent that we make veganism easier, veganism is sort of a fairly trivial thing to do anyways, but and it's not, doesn't lead to much social disapproval, at least in places like the Bay Area. And to the extent we make it easier, it has a less powerful signal to the people around us. So the more available vegan options become, the less impact they actually have on the people around us. So there's these diminishing returns. So, but it, I mean, it's just, that's just a hypothesis, a hypothesis of mine. I have no idea if it's true or not. And I think there are a lot of other possibilities. But I think what, where, where you're absolutely right, I think, is that that has to be the vision of where the world is going. It's just a question of like, how do we get there? You know.
Dylan? Yeah, I was just kind of thinking about, yeah, like how, how do we get there and are we, the movement is founded on moral grounds, but are we, are we basing all of our action on uh, changing uh, people's idea of morality or are we doing anything we can to make sure that those moral choices happen? Like for instance, like legislation, you know, like economic legislation about you know the tax industry. Yeah. Yeah. Are we just are we just hoping and trying and praying that everyone will become vegan, yeah. or are we like so that they are being moral, or are we actually trying more focused on actually just getting people to see the moral side of it, like yeah. what's more important and what's yeah, it's a fundamental question. Does ideology matter? And to the extent that it matters, how much does it matter? And like my my working hypothesis is that it does matter and quite quite a bit and that I mean I think the problem is as long as whatever you change in terms of the material conditions, the taxes, the subsidies, the availability of options, if the ideology of, of human suppressment, supremacy and speciesism remains, then it's very easy to revert back to old behaviors. This is true on an individual level, it's also very true on a systemic level. And the easiest way to see this on a systemic level is to look at countries like India or regions in China where people for sometimes centuries, if not thousands of years, have engaged in non-violent dietary habits, but when the broader systems around them are, I mean, and speciesism in particular, are infecting their communities, then they quickly respond by starting to eat animals and adopting the same industrial farming practices that we've adopted in the United States. So, like, those, those behaviors and those, those, not institutions, those behaviors are not sticky in and of themselves if there's no broader ideology or institution keeping them there. And so, and... I mean, from a certain pragmatic level, I, I, I agree completely that if we could devise like an alternative belief system, like, I mean, animal liberation isn't the only belief system that would imply nonviolence to animals. Like, you could believe in, for example, animal supremacy. <laughs> like, animals are better than all humans. And like, so pragmatically, I would say like, first of all, I think, you know, to the extent animal supremacy is a bad belief system, it's probably, and it probably is, or a non-human animal supremacy, it's probably not as bad as human supremacy because no matter how much power we try to give non-human animals, they can't abuse it in the same way that we can, just because they don't have the same capabilities that we have. But pragmatically, if we could kind of like devise, or even some crazy idea system like, oh, you know, like I don't believe in animal equality or, or human equality or anything, but I just believe, you know, there's a god in, in the sky who tells me I can't hurt animals at all. And if we could spread that sort of belief system, and we knew that it could stick and that it would retain, you know, the sort of virality that we need to spread animal liberation, then I would say, yeah, let's go with that belief system too. I think. But the key thing is there has to be some sort of belief system or institution that keeps behavior in place or else behavior will shift. It'll, it'll, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I always use the metaphor of like dropping a pebble into the water. Like if, if you drop a pebble into the water and you see the ripple, like, and all you do is look at it while it's rippling, then you think, oh man, look at that big splash I made. Like I changed the entire ocean. It's like, well, no, I mean, you made a little ripple and then it just restabilizes and goes back to the way it was. Because there's all these other forces, the moon, the, you know, the, the level of the water, the rain, that, that are causing the water to be at the level it is that have nothing to do with the little pebble you dropped in the bottom of the water. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I'm wondering whether a sort of a ratcheting strategy might be useful, because you, you, you mentioned like a catch-22. Yeah. Institutions really can't, they're not going to happen unless you have a certain momentum going on. Yeah, absolutely. And our momentum will always only get just so high until we have institutional changes yeah. that apply additional pressure. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think rationing is absolutely necessary. And I think, I mean, the civil rights movement, for example, didn't end racism. It was just a ratchet, you know? It was like, it, it was one step on the sticky staircase, yeah. you know, to, to, pro of, to fighting racism. And, I mean, like, I think it's, that's, that's just the way social change works. I will say that there, like, I think, when we talk about institutions, the institutions that matter most to us are still in our local communities. And I mean, Tip O'Neill's, I, I always use this quote from Tip O'Neill as a former Speaker of the House, a very kind of influential politician, a very effective politician. He said that all politics is local. I mean, the way, the way political change happens in this world is at the local level. And the way you get votes is by going door to door and like kind of integrating yourself into these local communities and convincing people in these local communities that they matter to you. And the same is true of institutions for animal rights activism. I think you know, the, the, our prospects for achieving federal legislation or constitutional change in the next five, ten years, pretty low. But we can change our local communities in some important ways, and we can start creating bigger and more powerful local communities. Those are institutions, too, that matter to us locally. So, 
And I mean, one example of this, within the Bay Area local, local community, there's like a norm that's been spreading against kind of just sitting passively and letting somebody eat animals in front of you. And that's, that's a norm that I think is a very powerful norm, and it's, it's an institution. It will eventually become an institution if it continues to spread. I mean, maybe it won't spread, and maybe it's not even the most effective norm. You know, I'm, I'm agnostic about whether it's the best meme. But those sorts of memes are, are signs of incremental progress that don't require us to change the entire world. We can, we can change each local community one step at a time. And like I said, in many ways, those institutions are more important than you know, the nationwide institutions. Because like what the Supreme Court thinks of gay rights matters a lot less to me than what my friends or my mother or my father or my coworkers think about gay rights. Well, I, do, that, that's, I think that's very relevant. Uh, I do believe that even though our Supreme Court, they seem isolated and very independent, I think it matters, probably impacts them a lot. As they see a groundswell of support. Right? Absolutely. You know what affects them even more than that, though? Their clerks. When they see these young people come and work for them, like talking about gay rights in a different way, and like, I mean, even at the Antonin Scalia's in the world, when, when Antonin Scalia sees his clerks, who are like the far right law students in the country, saying things like, you can't say that about gay people. I, know, I mean, I know you're a supreme I mean, justice. I mean, I know you're like a very distinguished scholar. You're one of the greatest minds in history from their perspective. Obviously, I don't think <laughs> Scalia is one of the, but from their perspective, they'll say like, yeah, I know you're one of the greatest minds in legal history, but you can't say those sorts of things about gay people because my brother's gay. And you can't say that about my brother. That affects Antonin Scalia way more than all the reason in the world. Just having someone say, like, stop doing that. And someone in his community, someone who believes in him saying that, like, is very influential. And I, I mean, there's been a lot of, there's a, there's, there's a long literature and a lot of biographies that have been written about Supreme Court justices changing in this way. Like, all these young clerks coming in and becoming good friends with them and, like, telling them, no, you know what, like, civil rights does matter. It's, it's not, you know, like, <laughs> there's this famous, not famous, there's this hilarious Family Guy sketch where, Lewis is talking about the, you know, the, the books that they're using in their local public school, and they describe the civil rights movement as trouble ahead. <laughs> and obviously, like, we've, we've re recalibrated our, our common understandings of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. It was common view that the civil rights movement was trouble ahead. And, but now we, we see them as heroes. And that sort of intellectual shift and moral shift and political shift, to the extent that it started in yeah. infecting people's local communities, was really, really important. Any other thoughts, Danielle? Oh, um, so I was just thinking. Um, I saw a lady wearing fur on the on the muni, yeah. and um, so going along with what we're talking about today, if everyone, like if, if everyone of, of our members, right, and every like if we put it out there, you know, so instead of saying to that woman, oh, you should really care about those animals, instead of saying a quick sentence. Just a, a really quick phrase. So if everyone who sees someone wearing fur just says politely, our society doesn't tolerate that anymore. Yeah. And just that sentence, not you have to care about those animals, that might have a really huge impact. Yeah. Because if, if then they put on the coat that day and, and say, oh, God, I don't want to yeah. walk out and hear yeah. this. I totally agree. Absolutely. So I, I don't think it's, we don't even have to pose that as a hypothesis. I know or at least I don't know this, but I, I've heard from, and I think I've read somewhere about it, the frown campaign in, against fur in London, where mm -hmm. basically London, they don't have fur anymore. And what I, my understanding is the, the way it stopped is basically anytime you wear a fur coat, it's not even that high percentage of people, but something like 5% right. of people on the street will just frown. They'll, like, right. they'll shake their head and look at you. And why would you buy a $5,000 coat so 5% of people will start looking at you and just shaking their head? You know? That's all it takes. Because, I mean, we're... Like again, we're we're such socially sensitive animals. We 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 are so attuned to. I mean, I use this in the effective meme spreading podcast, and there's actually a big literature on this because it's one of the the main theories for why language even exists. But the most important thing to, for, for most of us is how we're perceived by the people around us, even strangers, even strangers. Like if a stranger kind of comes up to you and says like, "Look at those boots," yeah. you're probably going to think about it all day and. Right. And you're gonna tell your friends and say like, oh, that that jerk, she, I can't believe she said that to me. It's you're gonna be thinking about that all day. And it's just, and it's because I mean, you. <laughs> for the record, Flea's boots are beautiful. I love her boots. Everything Flea wears is beautiful. So I did not mean to, you know, it's okay. I was impugn the boots in any way. So, so, but it's I mean, it, the, these sorts of stories are really infectious. And these like it's it, that's our brain has evolved to think about how the people around us are judging us, and that's. I mean, like I said, this is one of the theories from language. One of the theories from language is it evolved to basically allow us to gossip and 
talk to other people around us about how we feel about other people in our community. Yeah. There. Are, oh. Can I Go ahead, Zane. Um, it doesn't seem to be that popular around here. Well, maybe because Florida isn't that popular around here, but on the East Coast, I noticed that a lot of vegan restaurants will not allow fur. Mm -hmm. And if you walk in there wearing anything with fur, they'll be like, fur is welcome here. That's awesome. And I have never heard of that. That's yeah, great. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And, um, it's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. And that's, I feel like that kind of like, is an example of what I was talking about earlier, which is like, I mean, I know like, you don't think vegan restaurants matter, but mm -hmm. to some extent, but like, to me, at least when they adopt that kind of attitude, yeah. that does represent a kind of cultural shift. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. And to me, that's yeah. the difference between just being a vegan restaurant and being kind of an animal rights community space. Yeah. Right. That's that's where they've made the shift from just being right. selling people vegan products and trying to make money off of veganism to like taking an affirmative stand for animals. And that's a very fundamental and show and difference. showing a different way. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And yeah, you guys have really got me thinking. Yeah. That's a very fertile area for strategy. Yeah. It is. It is. Daniel. So, uh, so there's something else I was just thinking. Maybe um, there's a scientific basis to that um, wanting someone to not frown at you and wanting someone to instead applaud you because maybe you get like a dopamine rush from getting approval. Yes. And maybe yeah. you get like a decrease from a frown. Like, because you, you know, you want your parents' approval, for example. So you, yeah. you look for it. Like, oh. So maybe there's like some kind of a, a brain chemistry thing going on there. Yeah. Not just maybe, there is. Right. And it's a concept called loss aversion. Right? And the basic concept is that basically, I mean, this is kind of a rough estimate, it doesn't apply to all contexts, but a loss will hurt you about twice as much in terms of your motivation and your dopamine response and just how much it affects your behavior, about twice as much as an equivalent gain. So losing $10 hurts twice as much as gaining $10. Right? And the same is true of criticism. Chris, I mean, if you think about like the most memorable moments of your life, they're probably negative experiences. I mean, Right. right. In many ways, like that's stupid and like it's sad and it, it sucks because I wish we could kind of elevate the positive experiences and remember them as much as the negative experiences. But the truth is, they, and there's an evolutionary basis for this. Yeah. You know, when, right. when you have a negative experience, and it affects, especially one that can affect your survival, right. you know, you have to be really, really yeah. remember it. And you have to, like, yeah. but like a great experience, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, getting that fruit was awesome. But, yeah. you know, I mean, as long as I, it's not that big of a deal for me to, to make sure I go get that fruit if there's other food available. But, if I don't avoid like the scary man who's coming down on me and I'm gonna slip my throat, then I'm done, and my right. genes are no longer to proliferate right. through the world. So, right. not to get too sciencey yeah. people, but but yeah, I mean this is this is a loss aversion is not just a hypothesis; it's right. a it's a theory. Right. Right. I and mean, this has been demonstrated by yeah. thousands of experiments now that people are averse to losses and criticism and, and negative negative. It's called negative affect. A F F E C T much more than they're they're stimulated and encouraged by by positive things, which like part of me thinks it's like really messed up to even kind of take that into account because it suggests that we should be mean to a certain extent because if we're mean we're going to be more effective than we're nice. But then on the other hand, it's like to me it's not just about being mean because I think part of it is is not being mean. It's just it's acknowledging to people the bad things that they're engaged in, right? And and like helping them redeem themselves. Like I don't I don't see it as being mean. I see it as like helping people kind of become the good people they actually want to be. Because I think part of the problem is, I mean, most people don't actually like violence. They don't like suffering. And the problem is their society is just indoctrinated into thinking of this particular object as not violence and suffering, but as something else. And like, so if they can truly make an independent choice in themselves, most people will choose to not torture the puppy. And we just have to extend that same logic to the pig and the cow and the chicken and the whale and the rat. So, which we're doing, we're doing. I was thinking a little more, going back to the, I, the, the concept of um, ideology versus legislation yep. and um, the role that the concept of freedom plays in our society, freedom and democracy, and yep. looking at the civil rights movement, the, I think that the legislation that occurred out of it is probably, well, perhaps like the most kind of important result of the movement, yeah. but it wouldn't be, the legislation wouldn't be necessary if the ideology of people was entirely shifted. That's so true. in that sense, like, it's kind of, the ideology is 
like at the beginning it's a platform, but the legislation is it's kind of still. almost, yeah. So I don't know if you were here when I was talking about the expressive function of law, but there's a literature in, in psychology and law about how the, the primary impact of law on a lot of scholars' minds is, is not necessarily the, the kind of immediate impact on kind of costs and benefits, mm -hmm. but the expressive function, what they say about community understandings of appropriate behavior. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. So I think, I think the distinction, I mean, I, I see, when I think about institutions, I think ideology and culture are one soft form of institution, and law is another harder, formal institution. And both of them operate in, in similar ways. Um, and it's, it's kind of like the discussion I was having with Xander earlier. I think laws to have real influence, and I mean, there's, there's actually this old debate in, in legal philosophy and legal psychology between John Austin and uh, H.L.A. Hart about the nature of law. But laws to actually become effective laws have to become internalized by the people who adopt them, right? Mm -hmm. So if, the law, if all the law is is like, I'm going to punish you, you're going to have to go to jail. And if, and no one actually starts to agree with the law in any way, and no one internalizes the notion this law is something I should agree with, mm -hmm. then it's not really a law in like a lot of scholarship. What's that? Like pot being illegal. Or speeding. Yes. Or, fucking or speeding. I mean, there are many examples of this where there's like a nominal penalty. And even, but even, even like, I mean, John Ost, or, or HLA or Hart gives this example of like, it, I mean, it's a di dictatorship example that I gave before, which is that, you know, it, is a dictatorship actually affecting real laws if, you know, if every time it issues some promulgation, everyone defies it because they hate the dictator. I mean, HLA Hart says, no, this isn't actually a law. I mean, it only becomes a law when, when it's been collectively internalized in some way and people actually accept it, you know? Um, and I, I think, so I do think that sort of acceptance is, is a different sort of acceptance than like ideology and believing in it, you know? Because you can certainly have laws that people accept not because they believe in the law. And the best example of this is like, you know, driving on the right or the left-hand side of the road. I don't, I don't comply with that law because they think driving on the right-hand side of the road is just the way the world ought to be, and it's a good thing, and it's the ethical thing. I just do it because, okay, this is what we decided, and it sort of makes sense to me. Like, pragmatically, we should probably have one side of the road that everyone drives on, you know? <laughs> and, but the point is, like, whatever my motivations for internalizing that law, I have internalized it before it's actually become an effective law. And I think the same is true of the civil rights. Interestingly, um, so there's a prominent scholar of, of the civil rights movement named Michael Klarman, who's also at Harvard and is a colleague of my former mentor, Cass Sunstein, and he's written a lot about how Brown versus Board of Education, which was the law of the land after it became, you know, after it was decided by the Supreme Court, basically had no impact for, for five, six years because it hadn't been internalized. And so there was broad defiance in the South. Um, and the main impact, is, he, has a, he has a theory called the backlash theory. He thinks the main impact of Brown versus Board of Education was not in directly changing people's behavior, but in creating this public backlash. And it wasn't even that it empowered actors. What it caused was all these white supremacists to lash out at blacks and, and lynchings and violence and all this horrible thing. But it, it polarized the debate and forced people to take a side. And all these white moderates who previously had said, like, oh, you know, okay, yeah, it's terrible what's happening to those colored people, but it's not my problem and I've got my own life to live. Once it became this huge public issue and the Supreme Court was fighting about it and there were lynchings on the streets and it was on the front page of every newspaper, suddenly all those people had to take a stand. And when they took a stand, they took a stand against violence. Which is a good thing. That's actually an aspect I had considered. I was thinking, like, in that particular case, and I'm, I'm familiar with what he wrote, maybe a more foundational change, you know, systems of laws and our obedience to them has a certain forward momentum. Mm -hmm. But once you have, a, like, that crucial Supreme Court uh, ruling, yeah. now you've got, a, you've got something to fall back on. Over, over the coming years, people can bring lawsuits and say, hey, According to common law now established by this particular case, mm -hmm. it gives you a platform. Right. Yeah, before it gives you an emotional platform. Yeah. platform. Yeah, I think creating platforms, infrastructure for people to engage in activism is the most important form of activism. Mm -hmm. So, Priya, you had something to say? Yeah, a really good example of um, legislation which doesn't really change anything, especially relevant to animal rights, is foie gras. Um, mm -hmm. It's supposedly banned in San Francisco, but there's still restaurants. California. So, uh, sorry, California, but there's still restaurants which serve foie gras because there's no cultural change. Right. Yeah. And there's no cultural change and there's just like this legal win. It doesn't really matter right. because it's nobody not. feels invested in making sure that this, this law is actually, you know, that people are not breaking it. it just, yeah. People don't really care. Yeah, there's, there's some evidence that in Chicago after we banned foie gras in 2006-2007 that consumption might have actually gone up. Oh, my God. <laughs> Ironically, because... 
it was it was widely ignored. Um, the mayor of the city said, like, this is my lowest priority as you know, the chief executive officer of the city of Chicago. And it got so much press and so many people were interested in it. Like a lot of people heard about it who never heard about it. Like, oh, Fort Roth, that sounds interesting. I'm gonna go try that. <laughs> and especially before it gets banned, you know, like I'm gonna go eat a bunch of it. Right. So it's it's not clear. So it's law can definitely be sort of a double-edged sword, especially if it's not pushing us towards cultural shifts. I mean, I think Fargo is in some ways a good example, in some ways a bad example of effective legal activism, because I think in Chicago, at least, the grassroots movement very much used Fargo as a metaphor for animal exploitation. So, but most of the national profits, I remember there's one just embarrassing memo that went out to the list of organizers on the Fargo campaign in Chicago. We said, whenever you talk to anyone about Fargo, you can't even mention the word vegetarian. It's like a four-letter word that you cannot even say. And like when I saw this, I was like, oh, wait, what's the point?